So I first visited Prague in 2011 as a tourist. Naturally, I went and saw the Charles Bridge, Old Town Square, the castle, and all the other tourist sites. So I fell in love with the city. I was mesmerized by the beauty and the history that lie in the old cobblestone streets of Prague. A year later, on pure coincidence, I moved to Prague, and I have now been lucky to call this city my home for a little over three years. I've gotten to know the ins and outs of the winding cobblestone streets, the history and the architecture that leaves me finding new things every day. I know the quiet, calm winters and the crazy hot summers where Prague is just jam-packed with tourists. Tourists like I was back in 2011, when I knew nothing more but to adore the city. But living here, I have gotten to know some of the less flattering aspects of Prague. I've become familiar with the homeless community, learned about some segregation issues, but most shocking to me was the fact that Prague is a huge center for sex trafficking. Now, before I go any further, let me clarify what sex trafficking actually is. I'm sure most of you have heard of it, but perhaps you're unsure of what it actually means. So instead of giving you some big definition with lots of fancy words, instead, let me tell you the story of Olga. Olga is a financially struggling single woman from Ukraine. She finds a job online here in the Czech Republic, so she comes here leaving her family behind. Upon her arrival, she is met by the manager of the company she'll be working for. He takes her passport and immigration papers for safekeeping. But regardless, Olga is happy and excited to start her new job. But this trip soon takes a very different turn. Olga arrives at her house, where she is met by several other girls, scantily clad and malnourished. Olga soon finds herself in those same conditions. Men come in and out every night, shamelessly beating and raping her. Her skin is even branded with a tattoo as a mark of ownership. Her screams and pleas for help silenced by threats of death or harm to her family members back in the Ukraine. All while we admire the nightlit Prague Castle. But this is Olga's life now. With her documents seized, it is almost impossible to get out. Now, Olga is just a name. I gave her that name, and I gave her that story. But her story mimics the realities of millions of people around the world. Now, it's hard to be exact about the number, but ex experts estimate anywhere between 20 and 30 million human trafficking victims, with a significant amount of those victims being sex trafficked, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But first, let's just put this in perspective for a minute. 20 to 30 million victims. So the population here in the Czech Republic is 10 million. So we're talking two or three times the population of this country in human trafficking victims. So my interest in learning about this horrible crime began about a year ago. A few friends and I met with some local organizations here in Prague to learn about the horrors of this crime. Here are just a few of many facts that we learned. So one, 70 to 80 percent of trafficking victims are believed to have been sexually exploited in some way. So remember, we had 20 to 30 million victims in total, with 70 to 80 percent of these victims being trafficked. Um, two, over 50 percent of all human trafficking victims are estimated to be children. And three, 98 percent of sex trafficking victims are women and girls. But in my head, like most of us, I still had this preconceived notion that sex trafficking was localized to areas of Southeast Asia and Africa. Today, I am here to tell you that that is 100 percent not true. Sex trafficking, or any trafficking for that matter, is a world issue. And if you still don't believe me, here are some not-so-lovely facts about this beautiful country of the Czech Republic. So the Czech Republic is the third worst country in Europe for sex trafficking. It is mainly used as a transit source for moving victims from one country to another. Two, there are over 800 brothels in the Czech Republic, with 200 in Prague alone. Now, we all know that brothels are not exclusive to sex trafficking, but it does tell us a lot about the culture here. 
And similarly, a huge part of the Czech tourism economy is made of sex tourism. I came here to see the beautiful sights, but unfortunately, that is not the reality for many of the tourists that come here. I'm sure that you could find similar facts to this for your home country, and I challenge you to do that. Sex trafficking happens, and it happens everywhere in the world. But why? The answer is quite simple. Sex trafficking is a low-risk, high-profit business. So let's break this down a little bit. Low risk. Why is sex trafficking a low-risk business? Well, firstly, it's often easy for the traffickers to find victims because they prey on vulnerable women. Women who struggle financially, like Olga, or women who struggle emotionally. Women that are deemed easy to pursue. And secondly, sex trafficking is not a publicized issue. The majority of people know little about it or have misconceptions about it. Like I'm sure many of you might have associated sex trafficking with Southeast Asia before a few minutes ago. Additionally, government action has also been minimal because the issue is so complex. Think about it. We just said that sex trafficking is a world issue, which means that governments need to work together. And without getting too much into politics, we all know how difficult that can be. So to sum it up, sex trafficking is low risk because the traffickers run into very few obstacles. Now, high profit. How high? 99 billion dollars per year. 99 billion dollars in buying, selling, and sexually exploiting women. Okay, so now we have this low-risk, high-profit, horrible, inhumane business. So what can we do about it? I wish that I could stand here and talk to you about all the ways that we could eradicate trafficking, but I'm not going to do that because that would be an unfeasible goal. But there are ways that we can make the situation better, and we need to make change on both sides of this issue. We need to punish the traffickers, and we need to help and support the victims. And we do this on the levels of government and society. So first, let's talk about the government level. What are governments actually doing? Well, unsurprisingly, trafficking is illegal in most countries in the world. However, conviction rates are shockingly low. According to the UN report on drugs and crime from 2014, of 128 countries surveyed. 40% reported 10 or fewer convictions on human trafficking, while 15% reported none. Not one single conviction on a crime that affects millions of people around the world. This just shows what little a priority trafficking is in our governments, and that is what needs to change. New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof notes. The serious issues are perceived as those relating to nuclear warheads, trade, or Middle East peace, and the rest is fluff. In fact, we're seeing the rise of a new foreign policy agenda, side by side with the old one, consisting of issues like human trafficking, the environment, and genocide. They are every bit as important as the traditional agenda. That is to say that we must start to think of trafficking as an important political issue, and getting more action, more legislation in the government is the first step. We need to prioritize trafficking in our governments. Remember what I said before about trafficking being a world issue, so governments need to work together. Well, this can't even begin to happen unless we make trafficking a priority on an individual level. So that is the first step for the governments. But what about our society? Well, as a society, we need to help and support the victims,、um, and so we need to help and support the victims.、Um, and this starts with getting rid of the misconceptions that we have about these victims. Believe it or not, many people don't actually think of these victims as victims. They might say, "Aren't they there by choice? Why can't they just escape?" There's this notion of some kind of business or romantic relationship between the pimps and the girls, which is entirely untrue. Or if it is, it's because they're forced or coerced into doing so. We need to get rid of these kind of misconceptions and build a support system for these women. And to see how we can do this and also enact change on the government level, like I just talked about, 
let's take a moment to shift our focus to the issue of domestic violence. Now, domestic violence is a horrible crime involving physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. This is a graph from the United States Bureau of Justice showing progress on domestic violence rates. As you can see, they were extremely high and then take a drastic shift downwards. So, what changed? Well, in 1986, which is not shown on this graph, there were only 336 outlets um, that provided support for victims of domestic abuse. However, in 1994, which is the first bar on this graph, there were 1,441 services. And this is according to the National Directory of Domestic Violence Programs. So we see 1994 is the first bar on this graph, but as these programs pick up steam and popularity, we see that the rates drastically shift downwards. But why? Why the sudden rise in these programs to support the victims? Well, in 1994 as well, the Violence Against Women Act was passed, which along with many other clauses, demanded safety and security for the victims of domestic abuse. So this is an example of how government legislation led to a, um, a societal change in our attitudes towards the victims of domestic abuse. Now, we haven't eradicated domestic violence, not even close. It still continues to affect millions and millions of people per year. But look at this change. Look at what we've done. And this is the model that we need to use for trafficking. I also hope that you've noticed that this model coincides with my earlier point about low-risk, high-profit. By raising awareness, by enacting legislation, and by supporting the victims, we can turn sex trafficking into a high-risk business. But I'll reiterate that it all starts with awareness, and then we initiate change on a government and societal level. Now, right now you might be thinking, you know, government and society and awareness, these all sound like really big and vague concepts. And you know what? You're right. They are big concepts. But, there, but I'll tell you, there's no reason why we can't make a change what, like we did for domestic violence. Yes, it is going to be difficult. Yes, it is going to be complex. And yes, it might take 10, 15, 20 years, but that's okay. All we need to do is start. And we're already doing that with the awareness. So, I could go on and on about the various layers and complexities of this issue for hours, but we're coming to the end of this talk now. So instead, I would like to take you back to my first trip to Prague. When I first walked these beautiful streets, I came across this piece of graffiti in a small alleyway. It says, fight apathy, or don't. Now, while the artist is clearly trying to be funny and ironic here, it does raise an important point about how we deal with the issues and concerns in our society. We are aware of so many things, yet we choose to be apathetic towards them, or ignore them, or indifferent about them. But that is not the attitude that we can have if we expect to see change on this issue like we have for domestic violence. So, now we know what sex trafficking is. We know that it happens everywhere. We know why it happens, and we know ways of making the situation better. So let's not be apathetic about this. Let's not ignore this. That is the only way that we can make a change. So as one final note, I would like to leave you with this image. Fight apathy. My eyes are open now. I can see Prague for its beauty and its flaws. I know that behind this facade of beautiful buildings, there are girls out there that are scared, helpless, and alone. The only question that I have left is, can you do it too?